Hi, I'm Teresa Barash. This is my public defense seminar. I wanted to make it available so that my family and friends and colleagues can see what I've been up to the last few years. This is a presentation on plant-mediated interactions and how they inform integrated pest management. I'm a PhD candidate in the graduate degree program in ecology at Colorado State University. And I'd particularly like to thank my committee members for making this all possible. Especially my advisor, Paul Odie, and his wife and faculty member, Mina Bagopal, who's not on my committee, but they've both been extremely supportive throughout my graduate degree. So let's get into the science. When I first came to graduate school, I was assigned to read this paper on a hundred fundamental questions in ecology that are yet to be satisfactorily answered. My most, my favorite question was this one. How important are indirect interactions in ecological communities? Indirect interactions can occur between individuals and different species or within the same species. Let me give you an example. A plant might host a chrysalis, and out of that chrysalis comes a pollinator. And that pollinator can pollinate flowers, allowing the plant to produce fruits, allowing mammals to enjoy that fruit, and so on and so forth. So I'm really interested in what happens on one end of a metaphorical domino row and the outcome on the other end. I'm particularly excited about a certain kind of indirect interaction called plant-mediated interactions. This is when we're looking at interactions or a dom that metaphorical domino row with a plant in the center. For example, a plant may be fed on at the top on a leaf and in response send resources below ground and then a root herbivore can benefit from that as it has access to greater resources. These kinds of, interact these kinds of interactions can be really important for management decisions. Specifically, integrated pest management. Now when I talk about integrated pest management, I'm talking about combining any combination of management choices. So we might have chemical or mechanical treatment of weeds. We might even have restoration, bringing in native plants to try to compete with a weed. And one other method that is particularly important to me is biological control, classical biological control. Classical biological control is when we bring in a natural enemy, say an insect from the native range of our weed of concern, and that insect feeds on the plant to help control and manage it. The weed that I worked on is Russian knapweed. It's in the family Asteraceae. It's uh, poisonous to horses. It can reduce wheat production. That's our breads and cereals. Wheat goes into a lot of our resources, a lot of our foods. It can reduce wheat production by 50 to 90%. 
A stem of Russian knapweed or a shoot can produce 1,200 seeds. And in Montana a few years ago, it was estimated to cost $42 million a year. That's the equivalent of 500 jobs. The other thing about Russian knapweed, this is particularly important to remember for the rest of the presentation, is that it has this extensive root system. So if you're familiar with aspen groves, one tree of an aspen grove can actually be part of a much larger clone. Russian knapweed grows similarly. A stem of Russian knapweed can be part of a much larger clone, and many stems could be part of the actual individual plant. We'll come back to that. The biocontrol of Russian knapweed that we're going to talk about today is Japiella vonacovi, a galling midge, a Cicidomyidae. It's in the family Cicidomyidae. It's uh, in the order Diptera, so it's a fly. It's a very, very small fly. And it eats Russian knapweed. Here's a little female. And this here is, the, is a gall. So this insect develops inside that gall. Galls are really fascinating. Galls are like a hotel room for an insect. It provides room service and potentially protection from the elements and outside world. To bring this back to plant-mediated interactions, I'm interested in what happens when we have galling on one part of the plant and potentially galling on another part of the plant. Or to bring it back to integrated pest management, I'm interested in what happens when we have multiple management techniques on a whole clone of Russian knapweed. So if something happens on one stem, how does that impact another stem? Galling is an adaptation that has evolved many, many times. There are species of flies, wasps, beetles, aphids that gall. There are over 13,000 species, or maybe even 2 million species, of galling insects. There is more and more described all the time. Galling insects are highly species or genus specific. So they're often selected as biological control agents to reduce non-target effects. They're species specific because they need that particular plant tissue, a stem, a leaf, a reproductive part of the plant to be able to form that gall. And they need to be able to hijack that particular plant's physiology. I'm gonna talk about three empirical studies today and a review. I'll conclude with the review. First, we're looking at stem level interactions. When we have a female midge attacking one part of the plant, laying eggs in one part of the plant, what happens to a midge attacking another part of the plant? I'm also going to talk about the second experiment uh, on clones. What happens when we have grazing on a particular clone of Russian knapweed, that whole kind of patch of infestation. And how does that impact midge establishment? So this one, this question particularly feeds into that integrated pest management perspective. Can we combine the two management strategies of grazing or mowing and biological control release? Then we have land managers, and abiotic factors, people and choices that are made, and how those across multiple clones across Colorado, and how those impact plants and impact insect establishment and effectiveness in the field. 
My lab mates and I did a review to address how best to measure fa these factors in the future and bring them all together in a theoretical framework. So let's talk about that first experiment. We looked at midges sharing a stem and asked, do herbivores damage the plant more when occurring together? That's what we expected. As biological control agents, we thought that they would reduce plant growth. And then how do midges fare when sharing a plant on the same stem? How do plants mediate interactions between these midges? So we conducted this experiment. We have a control here with no insects, uh, one set of exposure, and two sets of exposures. The two sets were one week apart. Each exposure had three mated females because one out of three of these insects usually manage to gall. So two out of three of them are actually dying before they manage to do anything in the greenhouse. We expose these to the whole plant. This is a mesh, mesh around the plant. And the females were able to access the whole plant. In my naivety to the system, I expected that when bringing in a second exposure, midge would attack, insects would attack a new part of the plant. This is because they need fresh new material, meristematic material, to form the gall. However, we actually saw that midges were often lying, laying eggs in the gall from a week earlier. So, we did another experiment, restricting where the midges were able to attack. So we only allowed them access to one meristematic area, one place that could actually form the gall. And this is the same with that control, the once exposure, and the twice exposure. And we had a great gall formation rate. We had 100% of galls forming where we wanted them, and only two extra galls in the whole experiment. So when midges are sharing a stem, we're actually, we're seeing evidence for competition in both experiments. That whole plant exposure and the partial plant or oviposition restriction experiment. We selected, we had a random selection of galls that we dissected and measured for to look at those insects. And we saw that the average insects for the, per gall for one exposure were much greater than the average insect per gall for the two exposure treatments. For the whole plant exposures, we didn't see strong patterns in plant growth or flowering. In the oviposition restriction, we saw a really interesting pattern. Here on our x-axis, we have the control, our once exposure, and our twice exposure. And on the y-axis, we have the above ground wet biomass. And our plants are getting larger with more insect herbivory. This is also happening below, with the below ground biomass in an even stronger, in an even stronger way. This isn't great for the promise of biological control or the promise of weed management. But this isn't uncommon. Plants often compensate to that first round of attack with some extra growth or a little extra effort. To summarize those experiments, we saw that there's competition across spatial separation. 
and the whole plant exposure. And plants are getting larger with more midge attack. So that's a, a small warning sign as far as whether or not this biocontrol agent is a really good fit, a good management strategy. Though this was only a one month experiment, so it might be different with repeated attacks. All right, let's move on to that second set of experiments. We were interested in how herbivores sharing a clone might interact with one another. So say cattle and a midge, cattle and midges. We conducted simulated grazing and looked at how that impacted insect establishment. We thought that removing above ground plant tissue or plant parts, plant biomass, <laughs> would reduce insect establishment. And then we also looked at how these two strategies together impacted the plant across that whole connected clone. And we thought, we were hoping that those two stresses put together would really reduce that plant growth. So that these two management strategies would be complementary. So we set up 28 cages in the field. These are meter cubed cages, and seven cages per treatment. We had seven cages per treat. The treatments included control without any treatment, midge released, only simulated grazing, so that's removing half of the above ground plant material, and then combining those, having cages, seven cages with both that removal of tissue, the grazing, simulated grazing, and the midge release. We measured plots inside the cages and on the outside. If you all remember, that root connection, the way that clone grows, means that a treatment inside the cage might have an effect on the untreated fringe plots. We measured those for flowering, the tallest or the tallest stem per plot, and the density in the plots. So the number of stems per plot. We also measured, we tracked stems that were there at the beginning of the experiment to see how they changed in, leaving, in number of leaves, height, and biomass. So to look at the insect establishment with just midges, we got 31 galls. With the grazing treatment as well, we had 58 galls. And that's 130 insects for the just midges treatment and 237 for the treatment with grazing. When we control for cage and plot, we found that stems were five times more likely to be galled in the grazed treatments. So the grazing or the simulated grazing is actually enhancing insect establishment. That's great news for IPM, integrated pest management. Let's talk about the plant perspective. This slide is just predictions. Now that x-axis is simulated grazing, or and we have the no grazing on the left, and then yes on the right. The dark green are the insects, and the yellow is yes insects. 
And these are going to be box plots, so you'll see a median, quartiles, maximum, minimum, and little gray dots for the average, and those black lines are connecting those averages. So on the left to right, we have control, midge treatment, grazing, and then the combination of both midge and grazing. So on the left, we have an additive example. On the right, we have non-additive example. Let's talk through the additive one. If midges in decrease um, the stems per plot by 15, and wasps decrease, or and <laughs> grazing decreases by 15, together they might decrease from the control by 30. However, I expected that the being hit with two kinds of stress would decrease the stems even more. So say we have minus 15 from the insects and minus 15 from the grazing, but when we have the treatments together, it's minus 35 stems per plot. Okay, let's look at the actual data. We have the fringe plots here in the middle, our treated plots on the left, and our individual stems on the right, those tracked stems that were there throughout the whole experiment. This is important because we had a lot of new stems popping up. We wanted to know what's happening to what's already there. All right, so looking at all of these, I want you to see that a lot of these lines aren't parallel. We're not seeing a lot of additive outcomes. Remember, so with the first slide we had parallel ones on the left and not parallel ones on the right. When we look at our number of stems per plot. We're seeing some interesting patterns that we'll look at a little deeper. And it, these treatments aren't always decreasing the height or the buds or the stem or the ramp, stems per plot. When the individual stems, these tracked ramets, we are seeing more reduction with the insect attack. So that there is promising, and that's different than what we're seeing at the plot level. So let's focus in on that plot level. So on the left, we have control here, the number of stems per plot, and then we have an actual increase when we have insects only. We also have that increase when we have grazing only looks like another compensatory response. But when the treatments are occurring together, we get de decreased back down to that stems per plot. The cool thing is that we're seeing a similar pattern with the fringe plots. We're seeing that in those untreated plots nearby. And remember, that's likely because of this connected extensive root system. So this part of the plant is of course affected when another part of the plant is experiencing a treatment. All right, to summarize, simulated grazing did lead to more midges and that's promising for integrated pest management. Both grazing and insects actually increase the density of the Russian knapweed, so that's not great for management. But they might be good complementary treatments because together they are bringing it back down. So perhaps over time, the grazing and midge and biological control would have a negative effect on a clone. And from the plant-mediated interaction side, it's super exciting that those treatments are having an effect on parts of the clone that they weren't directly applied to.
So now let's talk about how management practices and abiotic fa factors impact midge establishment. We looked at clones across Colorado and did insect releases with the Colorado Department of Agriculture to see how these midges were establishing and how long they persisted. And we looked at how they're impacting plants by tracking some stems that were attacked in the field. So we had sites. We worked with a lot of people to get these sites across Colorado along the Front Range here. There's Denver and Fort Collins. Down the Arkansas Valley, this is Pinion Canyon Maneuver Site. This is in the southeast. The San Luis Valley, there's quite a few sites down there. We had a lot of great collaborators. That's near Alamosa, that's in Alamosa County. Then we have Archuleta County here, it's near Pagosa Springs and Navajo State Park. And then up here we have Grand Junction. Um, near the Palisade Insectary with the Colorado Department of Agriculture. And these, this is public and private land, Russian knapweed is genetically variable across Colorado. It looks like it was probably introduced multiple times by accident in possibly alfalfa. These regions are really variable. You can see that we have a big difference in latitude, longitude, and elevation. This is important because daylight hours and temperature can really impact overwintering. So I expected strong regional patterns, especially for the overwintering, for the insect ability to overwinter and persist at these sites. At each of these sites, we monitored the we monitored at the time of the release in spring. In the fall, a couple months later, the next year for overwintering, and then three years later for like from that good long term, longer term persistence. We'd get a release site and set a bouquet of 25 galls, that's about 250 midges that can emerge from there, in the middle of the site. These are, this is a nice wet watered bouquet in the middle of the site. And we monitored in these cross transects to see how our insects were persisting. Twenty-three of these sites were released in the spring of 2015 with really strict, consistent methods. So let's talk about those. After a few months, only 48% of the sites had galls, which are the easiest way to find the insect, the best sign of uh, insect initial insect establishment. If the insect's galled throughout the summer, the gall is probably still at that site and easy to locate. One year later, only 30% of those sites had galls. And then three years later, only two, 10%, less than 10% of those sites still have galls. Those two sites have quite a few galls. So they, those, those spots really, really blew up. Let's look at that map again. So in the the insects established initially across all of these regions. They did not overwinter in the Arkansas Valley. And the two spots that have galls still are at the Front Range and down in Archuleta County. These spots are particularly wet near irrigated or um, floodplains and they experience regular grazing. Thinking about those establishments further, 
we have this x-axis of the maximum temperature on the day of release of the insect. And on the y-axis, we have no initial establishment and initial establishment at the top there. I say these sites up here on the upper right were all late day releases, so those insects didn't actually experience that maximum temperature. They had the nice cool evening to emerge and get active. On the bottom left here, this site is a particularly dry, rough site anyway. So below 22 degrees Celsius, we're getting pretty great insect establishment. And then above 22 degrees Celsius, these insects are having a hard time getting going. Now looking at the, the way that these galls are impacting the stems in the field, we tracked 20 stems, one of our heavier field sites. In the spring, shortly after galling, our ungalled and galled stems are really similar heights. But by the fall, the galled stems are quite a bit shorter. So that's more promising for biological control and for weed management. To summarize, midge establishment is enhanced by being released on cool days later in the evening grazing, a bit moisture, irrigation or seasonal flood areas. And midges establish initially across Colorado, but not for long with these single releases. And they might be having trouble overwintering in some areas. So our biological control agents, we're not sure how great they are. There's evidence that the plant might compensate when first experiencing those insects. Now we have an interesting resource allocation story going on here with that compensation. Given this great below ground mass increase with insect exposure, and our great number of new ramets produced when the insects are, were released in this cage treatment, I think that the, ramet, the, the clone might be sending resources to other parts of the plant, producing new ramets, producing taller neighbor ramets, as we're seeing in the field here with that neighbor ramet. So that's a really interesting story, and it means that this resource allocation is important for thinking about how best to integrate pest management strategies. So we want to bring abiotic and biotic factors together. We want to make our domino row even more complex so that we can build predictions about where integrated pest management will work best and expand ecological theory and the ability to scale between individual interactions and what's happening at that larger site level scale. <laughs> the stress gradient hypothesis is, was developed to predict positive interactions. Let me define positive interactions. This can be a pollinator pollinating a flower. This can be a bear feeding on a fruit. And as the seeds go through the digestive system, they are better able to germinate and produce new flowers later.
And these interactions can change greatly with the abiotic context, whether it's a particularly dry day, whether it's, a particular, whether it's near a stream, or say a flood zone. And these kinds of interactions are important to be able to predict because then we can determine, we can scale up to guess at impacts on ecological communities and to look at how these ecosystem services are going to play out. Now the stress gradient hypothesis was first developed Here's our x-axis for our environmental stress gradient. Say so this is increasing stress. We, they, the, um, they suggested that the number of positive interactions would increase with environmental stress. So say there's quite a few community members, and between them it's going to be negative at this low environmental stress area, as maybe they're competing or um, all kinds of other interactions going on. But then as we go toward more abiotic stress, we're going to get more and more positive interactions. This was first developed when thinking about nurse plants. A nurse plant might shield younger seedlings, different species, from the hot sun. So we're first, so this was, this was first developed thinking about these between species interactions. Since then, oh, and it was also really focused on the number of positive interactions in an ecological community. Since then, it's been applied to the direction and magnitude of interactions. So the direction is negative interaction or positive interaction. The magnitude is how negative or how positive across a scale. And then it's also the inference from the stress gradient hypothesis has been applied to insects. So that's one higher tropic level than plants, which changes everything. When you have a higher tropic level, that is impacted so, so much by that first tropic level. So now we're bringing in biotic stress. Biotic stress can be chemical defenses from those plants. So studies have looked at this with a, a, a biotic stress gradient. And then people have also applied inference from the stress gradient hypothesis to within species interactions. It was first developed for interspecific, between species interactions, but this, but people have applied it to intraspecific interactions. So that's like my two midges sharing a host plant for their offspring in that greenhouse study earlier. Now my lab mates and I brought together some work to predict, we read quite a few papers to analyze the stress gradient hypothesis and this pattern of applying it so widely to different situations. And we looked at how these different factors, abiotic and biotic, are impacting an individual insect the fitness of an individual insect. And again, we're, up, we're focusing still on that intraspecific level within a species. There is quite a bit of awesome literature out there on the outcomes of these gradients, abiotic or biotic gradients, and potential predictions there, whether it's a linear or more of a curved situation. But since that literature is already out there, I'm gonna encourage you to go find it, read those reviews, our review is more about which factors are most important. So, <clears throat> we suggest methods for testing this in the future. Go out in the field or in your controlled research environment and collect data on that, those abiotic factors, the biotic factors, 
conspecific presence, and that insect fitness. And then we would test the, we would look at these different interactions using structural equation modeling or path analysis to determine how strong and what direction these arrows are and how this story comes all together. Now, if abiotic stress, if the abiotic stress gradient is the most important, we'd expect that these arrows will show up as strong factors in our model. Maybe abiotic stress is directly impacting the insect fitness, or maybe this is occurring more through a plant-mediated type of interaction. Or potentially biotic stress is having the biggest impact there. Perhaps the plant chemical defenses, physical defenses, nutritional value, there's a lot of great literature on all of this. <laughs> Perhaps that is the most important for insect fitness. And my favorite, those plant-mediated interactions. Perhaps those arrows are going to show up as very important. So in the future, we have researchers, new graduate students in the OD lab, current graduate students in the OD lab who are planning on following through with measuring with that structural equation modeling and measuring those factors. And then our, we also have research on those interspecific interactions. So we have, there's another biological control agent for Russian knapweed. It's a galling wasp, Olicidia acropylonica. And we've got research going on looking at how these two insects interact with one another, the midge and the wasp, biocontrol agents of Russian knapweed. Perhaps those two biocontrol agents will be complementary. Now, we built this amazing network of people working on Russian knapweed biological control and integrated pest management. I have a lot of people to thank through land access and collaborators. We had the Palisade Insectary and Colorado Department of Agriculture. That's including Dan Bean on my committee and Sonia, Mike, John, Jess. At the Fort Carson Army Base and that's Pinion Canyon Maneuver Site, we have Don James who helped so much. At the Alamosa Wildlife Refuge is Suzanne who drove me around to look at so many sites of Russian knapweed and really helped get all that, that started. We have the Weld, Alamosi, Pagosa County, Pagosa County managers at the time, Tina, Ginger, and Frank, who helped, helped me out a lot and helped with access to sites. Then the Denver naturalists. Tim Collier up at the University of Wyoming was a great resource and super supportive as well as Rich Hansen and Lynn Morales at a APHIS, and then a lot of private landowners and a lot of other managers that were so helpful. Then we had a number of uh, funding sites, or funding resources uh, that were really great, including a lot of programs at Colorado State University that were supportive in multiple different ways. Then I want to thank my committee members again, Paul Odie, Dan Bean, Melinda Smith, Boris Kondratia. The ecology program uh, is just a really great community of people. The 2014 GDP st um, rock star cohort, <laughs> as we've been known to, yes, as people have called us, mostly ourselves. We also have, uh, I mean, everyone in the OD lab, friends and family, 
and then I, I want to, um, there are other mentors at Colorado State University who have been so wonderful, and I know I can't name every single person, but there's such great mentors at the university. And then these research assistants, Jamie Barash, Alex, Alexa Wien, Sarah Painter, Nevin Klein, Aaron Parks, Emily Abrahamson, Kim Olson, and Ben and Katzi, and actually the, the California State University Dominguez Hills students helped with some dissections. And there were just, there were so many people involved in this research that I have to thank. Thanks for listening. If you have questions, please reach out and I will get to them as soon as I can.